हेलो एवरीवन दिस इज अनुराधा शर्मा एंड यू आर वाचिंग माय चैनल आंस विद अनुराधा IELTS Academic Volume 1 Published by IDP and Burlington English 2023 This recording is copyright Test 1 This is the IELTS listening test You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work All the recordings will be played once only the test is in four parts. At the end of the test you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part 1. Part 1. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. Good morning, Kingsbury Pet Hotel. How can I help? Hello. I was wondering if I could book my dog in for a stay at the hotel while I'm on my summer holiday in July. Sure. You're booking nice and early, so we have space available all through the summer. I'll just need to take a few details. What's the name of your dog? It's Oscar. <laughs> he's still only a baby, really, at just over one, but he's big because he's a German shepherd. Oh, yes. They can be quite big puppies. <laughs> and can I take your name, please? Yes, it's Simone Vittoria. So that's Simone with an E and V-I-T-T-O-R-I-A. Lots of people tend to add a C into my surname, which isn't right. Thank you for spelling it for me. Now... When are you looking for Oscar to come and stay with us? Well, I'd originally planned for a week from the 4th of July, but it now turns out that I can get another week off work, which is nice, but I won't actually be away for all of that. I'll have a few days at home at the end, so... ten days? Ten. From the 4th of July. OK, got that. Right. He's all booked in. So, just a few more details now. We can provide all the food, both wet and dry, so you don't need to bring your own unless you want to. How does that sound? Yes, great. Um, but he'll only eat dry food, I'm afraid. The wet stuff he doesn't touch. I'll make a note of that. We do, though, encourage owners to bring some items from home, so it's a bit more comfortable for their pets. You know, like a bed or a piece of your clothing. Well... The bed he has at home is rather large, but I suppose I could bring the blanket that he sleeps with. It seems he can't sleep without it. I'll probably throw in his teddy, too. It's his current favourite, but that seems to change every month. Not a problem. In terms of getting out for some exercise, we have a team of volunteers who try to take the dogs out twice a day, but sometimes three times, depending on what the owner requires. Oh, two walks a day is perfect for him. As long as he gets his energy out, that's OK. Great. Now, the other thing I'll need is proof of his medical history. Is his certificate still valid? Yes, absolutely, for another six months. I'll bring that with me, too. It lists his latest injections. Uh, before I forget, my pet insurance covers any medical treatment he might need while he's staying with you. Super. That was going to be my next question. I'll just write that down. OK, that's nearly everything. So the total cost comes to £150. Wow, that's good value. Yes, we're running a special promotion at the moment, although we only accept credit cards and payments in advance, if that suits you. Oh, yes. I'd rather pay right now, so it's all settled. Fantastic. We'll sort out the payment in just a moment but I've just realised I don't have a contact number for you. Can you give me your mobile number? Of course. It's 07101 889 434. 
Sorry, was that double eight nine three three four? <laughs> no, four three four at the end. Okay, thanks. Right, I think we're ready to take payment. That is the end of part one. You now have half of a minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good afternoon and welcome to the official launch in our auditorium of the new Westbourne Theatre, which replaces the old theatre that closed down almost 20 years ago. As the director of the theatre, I'm delighted to welcome you to our fantastic new art space in the centre of the town. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've done to the building and the improvements we've made. The original plan was to demolish the building and start from scratch. But as the building is historically protected, this couldn't happen. However, it turned out to be a blessing because during the restoration, we uncovered some unique features of the building that are now proudly on display in the auditorium. For example, if you look up, you'll be able to see some of the ornate decorations that now form part of the ceiling. You'll notice that the seats you find yourself sitting in are brand new and hopefully more comfortable than the previous ones. We were in no doubt that the old seats needed replacing, as much of the material was worn and it was more cost-effective to rip them out and install new ones. What has remained the same, though, is the stage area. This was in fairly good condition and just needed a bit of care to bring it up to modern standards. We were able to retain the size of the stage, so no space has been lost for the actors and stage crew. We were initially concerned that the steps leading up to the stage were unstable, but they only needed a few repairs, so they've remained essentially the same, but an improved version. Although the theatre curtain was in good repair, it was decided to change it so that it matched the colour and fabric of the newly installed seats in the auditorium. The old curtain wasn't wasted, though. We managed to donate it to a charity which will use sections of it to recover antique furniture to sell on and raise money for the Arts Council, which we're very happy to support. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. In addition to our exciting new premises, I'm also pleased to announce that we'll be offering a range of programs to suit a wider audience than previously. The first program, which will be starting in the next few weeks, 
is our Shakespeare season. This is a very exciting new direction for us, as we'll be presenting shortened versions of the majority of Shakespeare's comedies. It's hoped that these shorter plays will encourage more young people to get interested in the theatre and what it can offer. The plays will be staged by the Golden Theatre Company, which is made up of only women. This will bring a new dimension to the cast and will hopefully appeal to a more varied audience. In line with our dedication to bringing theatre to all ages, we'll be running children's workshops in the near future. We already have a list of professional actors from the area to run classes on the art of making speeches and demonstrating emotion. Those children who don't want to appear on stage will be able to have classes in set painting and set building, which will allow them to be involved in a different aspect of theatrical production. As I mentioned earlier, we're great supporters of the Arts Council, especially as they've given so generously to the restoration of our theatre. Therefore, in honour of them, we'll be holding special charity events throughout the year, or, to be more specific, six times throughout the year, so every two months. These events are intended to raise money for the council, which does such wonderful work in promoting the arts in the local area and nationally. Events we've booked so far include a comedy night, an evening of musical performances, as well as various dance recitals. I think it'll prove to be very exciting. So, let me move on to introduce you to the... That is the end of part two. You now have half of a minute to check your answers to part two. Part 3. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. So, Hannah, thanks for coming in to see me today. Thank you for asking me. I thought you'd want to talk to me about the last essay that I handed in. I know I probably didn't do enough research on the topic. Actually, I thought your essay was well written. No, I'd like to discuss the presentation you gave last week as I feel that we could make a few improvements. Oh, right. OK. How do you think you performed in the presentation? I don't think I did too badly. I spoke loudly enough for everyone to hear, although I think I could make my slides easier to read. I could see some of the audience were struggling with that, but I felt confident enough with what I was saying. Good. I'm glad you mentioned the slides. It's refreshing to hear that one of my students knows what they did right and what they did wrong. I'm a little worried that you left out some vital information in your presentation, though. The diagrams you presented were fine, but can you think what else you might have missed? I can't think of anything. OK. A lot of your presentation was based on research done by other people. Whenever you quote information like this, you must reference them, 
whether it's an essay or a presentation. It's important to do this so you can prove what you're claiming and back up your information. You might need to revisit the books you read in the library to get the information, and don't forget to check how the references should be listed. Ah, uh, I see. I was confused about what to do with those, but now I see I have to put them in. I thought about putting them in my handouts, but in the end, I didn't have time to make any. Yes, it was a shame that there weren't any handouts. It would have made your work easier to digest for the audience. Saying that, you managed to get across all your information in the allotted time, so your time management was on point. The other thing I want to mention is to not stand in front of your slides. Oh no, did I do that? I didn't mean to. I thought I was moving around a lot or playing with my pen. Was it distracting? No. In fact, you stayed still for most of it, and I didn't even notice your pen. But you must be careful not to obstruct the slides you've prepared, especially with no handout. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Right. Let's talk about your next assignment. Have you chosen a topic for your essay? Yes, I think so. I originally chose the French Revolution to write about, but when I looked into the notes I'd made, I didn't think I could make a convincing argument, so I changed to the history of medicine. I think that's a good choice. We've covered that a lot in our sessions, haven't we? Looking back at your last essay, I think you need to work on the concluding argument. You wrote a fine introduction, and it was well-researched, but I felt you needed more persuasion to finish it off. Right. Thanks. Do you have any suggestions of where I could go for some extra help with that? Are there any online resources you'd recommend? I'd avoid the online stuff if I were you. You could always try the Writing Centre on campus. There are tutors there with excellent knowledge in concluding essays. Great. I think I'll check them out. One final thing. When does the essay need to be handed in? This should be in your diary. The essay deadline is next Thursday, in the morning. If you need a deadline extension, remember to email me, and we'll see what we can do. All right? That is the end of part three. You now have half of a minute to check your answers to part three. Part 4. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this session, we're going to be looking at some of the history of the use of water mills in Britain. As we know, the main mechanism of the water mill uses hydropower to generate movement 
in order to complete a process. These processes included grinding or rolling in industries which were involved in making flour, paper and wood. What many of you may not know is that watermills can be classified into two main categories, depending on the position of the wheel. The first is known as a vertical wheel, which occurred much more frequently than the other, known as a horizontal wheel. This latter specification was evident in early examples of the mill, but seems to have been dropped in favour of vertical mills from around the 13th century. The earliest known examples of mills come from Roman Britain, where horizontal wheels, originally invented by the Greeks, were used. The Doomsday Book, which was written around the year 1086, listed approximately 6,000 watermills in Britain. Almost 300 years later, it's estimated that this figure had likely doubled. It's reported that some of the mills continued working into the 20th century, but only a small number of these survive today in various states of repair. Although it is probable that the majority of mills were designed with one purpose, many mills often changed function, depending on demand and availability of raw materials, but this was unlikely to have necessitated a change to the position of the wheel. Due to the very nature of how water mills were driven, the majority of mills were located on a river bank in a river valley. This would allow the flow from the river to turn the wheel, enabling the process. However, differences in the river flow due to seasonal variations in rainfall would affect the efficiency of the mill. In other examples, the mill was constructed and set away from the river bank. Then, a man-made channel would divert the water from the river into the channel to force the wheel to move. Occasionally, a dam was built to allow water to be conserved in times of low flow, and this often led to the creation of a mill pond, where water would collect when the mill was not in use. These two examples of water mills were rather restricted in where they could be located, and therefore were limited in how far they could be spread across the country. There were two ways to combat this. Firstly, the construction of tide mills aimed to enable millers to relocate away from rivers. A tide mill uses seawater, driven by the rise and fall of the ocean tides. These were naturally situated on the coasts, at an inlet or an estuary. Similar to some of their river-based counterparts, tide mills often consisted of mill ponds which were closed off when the tide fell to create a reservoir of water to allow milling to continue. The River Thames in London is a tidal river and, in the 18th century, there were an estimated 76 tide mills in the city with some on London Bridge itself. An alternative to the tide mill was known as the ship mill. This consisted of a mill with a wheel housed on a floating deck, which was usually placed in the middle of a river, where the flow was fastest. As the mill was floating on the surface of the river, the water levels didn't generally affect the continued use of the mill, unlike its landlocked equivalents. Piers were built from the land to allow access to the mill, and a mechanism existed so that the structure could be pulled to the side of the river to avoid it becoming an obstruction. However, as river traffic began to increase, the existence of the ship mill hindered progress, and it soon became abandoned. Even though tide mills and ship mills enable the use of hydropower to be spread across the country, it appeared that windmills were an even more effective mill to carry out the same functions. These mills came to Britain in the 12th century and proved to be popular. This was because they were cheaper to build than any kind of watermill and were more flexible in where they could be located. These windmills had to be situated facing in one direction in a hilly area in order for the mechanism to work. This would indicate that windmills were just as restricted as watermills. 
Improvements were made, though, and the postmill allowed the sails of the windmill to be moved in any direction to catch the wind. Making the tower of the windmill higher also made it possible for windmills to be located in less hilly areas. Therefore, with these innovations, the spread of windmills across the country was relatively quick in comparison to that of watermills. Even though wind power tended to be more effective than hydropower, both fell out of use in the 1880s when steam power came into effect. Due to the advent of the steam revolution, milling could be done away from hilltops and rivers and placed in more efficient locations, such as near docks for easy transportation of goods around the world. This development meant the watermill in most countries was rendered obsolete apart from in a few developing countries that still continue to use them and now mainly remain out of historical interest and importance. That is the end of part four. You now have half of a minute to check your answers to part four. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more videos.